It's quite a showing. Thank you guys for all coming. This is amazing. Uh, my talk is on ACL injuries. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Eric Reitmeyer. Uh, and it's going to be, it's a big topic and not a lot of time. So I'm really just going to try to touch on the main uh, bullet points here. So my background, I'm actually certified in both general orthopedics and sports. Um, took the sports fellowship in San Francisco. Did my residency in Boston at Harvard Medical School back home in upstate New York. And uh, for college, I was in, in uh, Cambridge. So, and I've been practicing now for about 12 years uh, in private practice here ever since. So, so the incidence of ACL injury, something that uh, Kevin alluded to a little bit is um, the mean age has stayed about the same for decades. It's about 29 years of age when someone undergoes an ACL reconstruction. The groups that have been growing are the, le the greater than 40 year olds. As we get health, uh, healthier in our later years, we tend to remain more active. So this, has, uh, this group population has increased by over 200% from the years 1990 to 2006. Uh, and that number is even higher for the less than 14 age group, the kids who are into pretty high level sports year round, don't get much of a break. So we're seeing more and more injuries in that group as well. So it's one of the more common procedures we do in the, in the United States uh, in orthopedics. And there's constantly uh, updates and improvements in the, just not the techniques, but the management. Um, so. Diagnosis is pretty straightforward. It's mainly based on the history, usually a twisting injury uh, where a, uh, an athlete will go down in the field, uh, usually associated with swelling. It's the kind of thing you don't really get up from right away and you probably get carted off the field. Um, and then afterwards, after the swelling goes down, uh, a hallmark of an ACL deficient knee is instability where uh, the knee feels loose, especially when you try to move or cut or pivot switching directions at higher speeds. So when someone comes into the office with these symptoms, it's a pretty high degree of suspicion that it's uh, an ACL injury. So for physical exam, the, the hallmark, the most sensitive test is what's called the Lachman, which is where you take the patient's knee in about 30 degrees of flexion. Uh, when they're relaxed, you can actually pull forward on the tibia. And this red structure right here is where the ACL sits in the knee. And if it's torn, you can imagine that the tibia is going to rise up further than on the other knee. A similar test is the anterior draw. This is a little bit easier to do for uh, the family care, primary care practitioner, uh, where you bend the knee up to 90 degrees and you sit on their foot here and you can push forward on the tibia. It's not quite as sensitive as this test, but a, little, but a, a quick, uh, quick and dirty test that can give you an idea of what's going on. And then imaging, um, mostly it's based on an MRI. We usually get x-rays, especially in the older patients because you wanna rule out significant arthritis. So a weight bearing x-ray is important because uh, that can contraindicate ACL reconstructions. Uh, but the hallmark is again the MRI. So this is what a normal MRI looks like. This is the ACL right there, running as a dark line that's uninterrupted from the tibia to the femur. This is what a torn ACL looks like. So you can see that the ligament comes up to about here. And then this is all disorganized edematous tissue, scar tissue. Uh, and oftentimes you can see corresponding bone bruises in the tibia and the femur, which indicate that it's an acute injury, or at least within the past few weeks. And this is actually what a, an MRI looks like of a reconstructed ACL. So you can see the tunnels in the femur and the tibia. So non-surgical management can be done. An ACL injury is, uh, or ACL reconstructive surgery is elective. Uh, so it's always a conversation that you have, a surgeon has with a patient to determine what their goals are, what their expectations are. And uh, if they choose non-surgical management, then you can go through a rehab. It's not benign neglect. It's actually pretty hands-on where you go through a rehabilitation program to restore the full range of motion for starters, uh, normal gait, and then regain muscle control and endurance. Obviously, fatigue is a, is a risk factor for re-injury. Uh, and sometimes by simply building up the muscle uh, envelope around the knee joint, you can compensate for a torn ACL, especially if you're um, not getting back into high level division one high school or college sports. Um, there is a higher risk of injuries after an ACL injury, especially one that's not uh, reconstructed because of the instability. Uh, the meniscus is prone to being damaged as are the, car the cartilage 
surfaces covering the bone. So chondral injuries can be more common, uh, and that's been shown pretty, pretty convincingly in a lot of studies. So um, one thing that we used to go by more is a, is a rule called the rule of thirds. Uh, this is a little bit um, out of date, but we still use it to some degree. It used to be a third of the patients would be what we call copers, a third would be adapters, and a third would be non-copers. I'd say the majority of people are now either adapters or non-copers. Uh, the coper group has, has diminished slightly. But what that means is a coper is someone who does some activity modification, goes through the rehab program, and manages to deal with a torn ACL without surgery, no problems. These tend to be uh, NFL linemen with legs like tree trunks that have so much muscle around their knees that they don't need their ACLs. They probably torn both of them and don't even know it. Uh, the adapters are people who can modify their activities. They'll switch from playing soccer in a weekend uh, league to getting on an exercise bike. Or most people can kind of run in a straight line, get on a bike, swim, the so-called triathlon sports without, without a need for an ACL. It's really the cutting and pivoting that requires the ACL. And then there are the non-copers. There's a few patients who just have so much instability in their knee that they can't even walk across the exam room without their knee giving out. So the non-copers were traditionally the ones that re needed surgery. Everyone else, it was somewhat more elective. So surgical management comes into play after this discussion with the patient. Uh, if there's persistent instability in spite of going through a rehab program, so we usually don't do surgery right away. We'll often give it a trial of some conservative measures before resorting to surgery for a number of reasons. I'll talk about that a little later. If there's gross instability on exam, for example, the one knee just feels like an overcooked piece of chicken meat uh, compared to the other one, then they're probably not gonna do well and you can start planning surgery on that one right away. Uh, and then a desire to return to activities like a college athlete or a high school athlete who wants to get back onto the playing field, which involves cutting, pivoting uh, at high speeds or carrying loads. Um, and surgical management, which is kind of the core of what we're talking about today, is the, um, has become less invasive. More arthroscopy is done for more uh, conditions with the same outcomes. Uh, smaller incisions for traditional type surgeries, and it's definitely impacted ACLs. Uh, biggest incision I make now for a hamstring or an allograft is about this big, and then the two little poke holes are a couple of millimeters. Um, and you're getting the same outcomes in, uh, in surgeries that used to be more involved, so quicker recovery time, quicker return of motion, and overall a more pleasant experience in the operating room. So, Initial management timing is, is uh, pretty well established now. Most people will wait at least a month after an ACL injury before considering surgery uh, because you want the swelling to come down, you want the uh, soft tissue envelope to sort of heal the capsule and all the other injuries that go along with an ACL tear. Um, there are some pockets around the country that still believe in doing surgery right away. These are mostly out in Vail and Aspen, Colorado where they have a mobile group of patients who are gonna go back to Massachusetts and have their ACL done there if they don't do it right away. So uh, if you wait beyond six months, there's some data to show that that can increase the risk of injuries. Again, you know, if, especially if there's instability, you can start to damage the meniscus or chew up the cartilage. So during those, that first month, it's really just about getting swelling under control, rest, ice, compression, elevation, the rice therapies. And then there's a role for preoperative physical therapy, and Dave's gonna talk more about this uh, in, 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 a, in a couple of talks from now. Uh, but pre-op quad strength and range of motion are notable predictors for knee function after an ACL. So that's the other reason we wait, because usually if you're doing it acutely, there's stiffness, you don't have the full range of motion of the knee, and that's a setup for chronic stiffness after the ACL. So you wanna make sure the patient has their full, full range of motion and as much strength as possible to speed up the recovery and improve the outcome. So graft types, uh, there's basically two. There's the allograft, which means cadaver tendon, uh, with which there are a variety. Most common is the uh, uh, Achilles, which uh, is, is nice because you can leave a piece of calcaneus on it and you have a bone plug at one end. Uh, whoops. Um, which this is a, uh, an actually an autograft. This is a, a patella, bone patella, uh, B to B tendon, so-called, which uh, means bone patella tendon bone, um, which is kind of the hallmark or has been historically the hallmark of grafts. Uh, the other autograft is the hamstring. Uh, 
um, which I actually prefer, but I'll get into that a little bit more too. That is all soft tissue. It tends to be a little bit thicker um, and there's a little bit more versatile. Uh, same reason that I prefer the Achilles allograft, the cadaver, because you can vary the length. You're not committed to the distance between the bone plugs, so to speak. So the still the, the hallmark, the bone patella tendon bone graft um, is still used widely among professional athletes and football players and that kind of thing. Uh, it's harvested as the middle third of the tendon. So you take a plug of bone from the patella and a plug of bone from the tibia, and then you cut the middle third of the tendon that's attached to the two bone plugs out and you end up with this beautiful graft that's the same size and width and strength as an, a as a native ACL. Um, and I find that some of the drawbacks and some of the uh, more recent thinking is that taking a big plug of bone out of the kneecap may not be such a great idea. There, there are uh, cases of fractures through the kneecap even months later. Jerry Rice, as soon as he returned to play as a wide receiver, fractured through his kneecap six months after his surgery. There's suggestions that this increases the risk of knee pain, of kneecap pain, difficulty kneeling uh, on the kneecap for obvious reasons. So um, I do this, but by far the majority of my autografts are the, the hamstring. So through a pretty small incision, you can harvest two out of the four hamstrings in the back of the knee. Uh, so these are the two medial hamstrings, it's semitendinous and the gracilis. Uh, so gracilis here, semitendinous behind it up here that uh, can uh, be doubled up and then folded over. You end up with about 20 centimeters of tendon using this special device called a tendon stripper. Um, and with sutures, you can then harvest it all the way up into the thigh. And as I mentioned, there's four hamstring tendons in the back, so the two on the outside are, remain, and these two actually regrow uh, over the co course of about the time it takes to recover from an ACL. So initially, there's some controversy over the hamstrings being a stabilizer of an ACL deficient knee. By removing it, aren't you setting it up for possible failure? But none of that's panned out. So far, most of the data shows that these graft types are all pretty much equal in the long run. Um, and uh, there is recently a, a shift from using allograft to autograft uh, in younger patients, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the other thing that's changed recently is the orientation of the tunnels. So the ACL is actually made up of two bundles. There's an anterior medial bundle and a posterior lateral bundle. Historically, we used to recreate the anterior medial bundle, and that was by drilling kind of a vertical tunnel through the tibia and then using that same tunnel drilling a hole in the femur, and this is about as far over as you could get. It's now dis established that it's actually the posterior lateral bundle that provides the majority of the stability, especially of the rotational motion. You can imagine where this attaches lower down on the wall, that's gonna provide less, more of a resistance to the torque. So this is the bundle we're now creating pretty universally. And for a while, there was a push to do two tunnels, a double bundle technique, ACLs. Uh, it was a big push out of Pittsburgh. Turns out that that doesn't really make any difference and is technically a lot more complicated, so pretty much the only people still doing it are the ones in Pittsburgh. Um, but uh, so this moving the tunnel, if, if you look at it as a clock face down to more of, if this is noon, this is about 2.30, where you used to be doing it about one o'clock or 11 o'clock on a left knee. Uh, so th this is pretty well established to improve uh, function after an ACL injury. Uh, and then graft fixation has is constantly changing. Uh, the I, the goal is to get a uh, as stable a knee a, a stable a fixation as possible. Eventually, the graft grows into the bone and and reattaches itself. And whatever you use for a fixation device doesn't need it can dissolve or disappear. And, uh, but it's that early stabilization that enables you to do the accelerated rehab programs where you get someone up on a bike within a few weeks and starting to. Uh, stretch things out and strengthen quickly. And if you have solid fixation, you can do that comfortably. So the mainstay of fixation has been some sort of bone screw. And the biggest change uh, that's occurred over the years is we've moved from metal screws to plastic screws to now bioabsorbable screws. These are screws that dissolve and form bone over time. And that's really revolutionized um, management of ACLs, especially ones that go wrong, complications. It's much easier to deal with this, a screw that dissolves and form, forms bone that you can drill through uh, 
uh, and doesn't leave much of a tunnel versus a metal screw that has to be taken out often leads to widening of the tunnels and you have a lot of the ACLs that, I, that are revisions that fail, I can do in a single stage now, whereas when we were using these metal screws, you'd have to take the screws out, bone graft the tunnels, come back at least six weeks later and do a second surgery to, to, revi to reconstruct the ACL again. So this is what the x-rays used to look like, big bone screws on the x-rays on uh, both sides. Now it's, uh, now the, the, the screws are invisible. So these are what my x-rays look like now, where you can see the tunnels, but you can't see any screws. They're there, but they're the dissolvable kind that disappear. And then eventually, over the course of a couple of years, the tunnels kind of disappear as well. And it can be hard to even see that there was ever any surgery other than based on the incisions. Other types of graft fixations, I've used these years ago. This is an endo button. This is called a graft bolt. I used this for hamstring fixations for a while. And then this is the transfix pin, which is also a form of hamstring fixation on the femoral side. Used that for a long time. Now I'm using a tightrope device, which is similar to this, but adjustable. So you can, these are what I use for my hamstring fixations on the femoral side. This landscape is constantly changing. There's, there's been staples, there's been all kinds of other fancy screws and devices to try to get the, the graft to be as solid as possible. Uh, and really, it, I think it keeps coming back to the uh, intra, our intratunnel screws, those interference screws that I showed in the last slide, and then some form of uh, loop fixation for the, ham, for the hamstring tendons in particular, which loop over. Uh, but there are constantly new devices appearing on the market. It can be somewhat dizzying at times. But um, so return to play. Uh, unfortunately, in spite of our best efforts and um, you know, constant uh, improvements in technique and accelerated rehab, for a, all comers, it's about 70%. It's a little bit less for high school and college age. You know, again, the, the football players that are playing at a very high level after an ACL injury, their, their return to play can be as low as 50%. Uh, and it's un unfortunately, it even seems to be the case where the graft went well, the surgery was uneventful, it's completely healed, the knee feels stable, and uh, there's a lot of factors involved, including psychological, and one of the biggest um, concerns by these athletes when they go back is uh, fear of re-injury. So that's another thing that we, another aspect of the treatment. Um, so. Typically, return to play occurs as soon as six months post-op. Can take up to a year, especially for an allograft, uh, because it takes longer to incorporate into the bone, so you want to protect it a little bit longer. Uh, functional bracing is a little bit controversial, whether you need to wear a brace after having had an ACL reconstruction. My policy is I let most people return at six months, uh, kind of leave it up to them after that, uh, assuming everything appears to be healed. I do use a functional brace, so it's like a sports brace. It's one of the slim, uh, semi-custom, you probably saw them out here on the table uh, in the lobby, uh, that they wear just for sports, just the cutting and pivoting activities from the six-month mark out to a year. And I feel that if we've done everything correct, that by a year, that you shouldn't need any type of bracing or anything. Uh, that's kind of why we did the surgery, otherwise everybody would be just wearing a brace. Um, one exception to that is, is skiers, downhill ski racers. There seems to be some data that suggests that there's an increased risk, that the, that the functional brace provides some protection to those skiers from re-injury. There's a higher rate of re-injury, uh, the Lindsey Vaughns of the world. So they wear their braces pretty much for a lifetime. Um, and I think that's it. So the one other thing I was going to cover with a graft, I might have missed a slide, is the push, one of the big things that's come out of the literature over the past few years is the push for more allograft, uh, sorry, less allograft, particularly in younger patients. There's, um, so we use their own tendon, an autograft, patella tendon or a hamstring, uh, because there has been shown now in one of the big thousands of patient studies that there's about a 15% failure rate in the high school college age crowd. So anyone under the age of 25 or 30, I, I still have the conversation, but I definitely push towards the uh, the, the autograft method of graft fixation. Uh, the, beyond that, uh, in the Weekend Warrior 40 plus, uh, it goes either way. 
Allograft tends to be the, the graft of choice because sometimes the patella tendon or the hamstrings are just not great quality. They're starting to undergo some deterioration as we age. And I think that is it. Yep. So any questions? Uh, so that <laughs> professional athletics is a little bit of a different beast. I don't like to call it veterinary medicine, but <laughs> it can sometimes resemble that. And they don't always do what's in the best interest of the athlete, and they do what's in the best interest of their short-term career. Uh, so I'm not sure if he, has he had surgery yet? I don't, I don't know. No. I mean, if, if it were out of Boston, uh, if it were Patriots player with um, one of with Scott Price, who's now the physician there who I trained with, uh, he would do the usual four week wait, start rehab, get the full range of motion. He'd probably be in the weight room on an exercise bike with, with resistance, the whole, the whole deal to maximize the uh, outcome of his ACL reconstruction, which would probably happen at the earliest four weeks, probably no later than six weeks. Uh, so the question is, do we see any weakening of tendons because of the use of fluoroquinolone antibiotics? Yes, so that's a pretty well-known complication of fluoroquinolones. It's, it's usually not a, a ligament uh, per se, like the ACL or the PCL or the MCLs. It seems to be more the tendon uh, that's affected. Classically, it's the patella tendon or the, hand, or the Achilles tendon that rupture uh, after a course of fluoroquinolone uh, treatment. It's pretty rare, but it does happen, and it happens enough that makes me pause before prescribing those antibiotics. Uh, so a younger athlete with an ACL tear, is there any effect on growth? Or, yes. Yeah, so, so the, uh, the, the techniques are slightly different. I didn't get into this uh, with a limited time, but uh, with an open growth plate, the surgery changes. You can't violate that growth plate unless they're within a year or so of, of physeal closure. Their growth plates are going to close within a year. Uh, prior to that, and we do see ACL injuries in kids as young as six, seven, eight years old. And historically, they were said, well, just leave it alone until they turn into a teenager, and then you reconstruct it. So turns out that's not a good idea, the, that they need to be fixed. They need to be stabilized early, just like any other athlete. And they are what are called physeal sparing surgeries, where you don't cross the, the growth plate. You either come out below it, or if you cross it, it's only with soft tissue. There's no hardware. There's no screw or anything that, that could disrupt the growth plate, because that is definitely a risk. And if, there, it's, if you do disrupt the growth plate, you can end up with uh, a varus or a valgus, a bow-legged or a, a knock-kneed, uh, one-sided athlete that wouldn't be very happy. So thank you.